Well, good afternoon. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to be here. I am so impressed. The World Affairs Council, I was not familiar with it until Judy called and uh, asked me if I could talk a little bit about agriculture being so close to home, as she said here, maybe a little bit more of an international uh, stint to it as well. But I, I have to say I learned a lot, and I, I want to thank Judy, and I want to thank Larry, and I want to thank the board of the World Affairs Council for having me here today. Uh, what I want to do is, is really give you a little bit of background about California Agricultural Leadership Foundation, as well as uh, where we are in terms of California agriculture in the world. But before I do that, I also want to recognize one individual in this room who I had the pleasure of uh, working with for many, many years, and that's Congressman Sam Farr. And going back to Sam, going back to uh, D.C. Uh, many times, whether we were on issues maybe involving table grapes and stone fruit, peaches, plums, nectarines, things like that, but we knew that Sam was key, anything having to do with agriculture on a nationwide basis, it really was his leadership and the reasonableness of his leadership, which really has put California agriculture in the position it is. So I publicly want to thank you for all of your efforts. So, um, what's the guy from uh, Madera, California, if uh, you know where Madera is, winds up in Pacific Grove, which by the way I love uh, because of the history and everything, and how do I get involved with the California Agricultural Leadership Foundation? Let me give you a little bit of background uh, about the foundation itself. In terms of its history, there were individuals that as early as the 1960s understood that things were changing and that there needed to be a formal way to better educate production agricultural individuals to be leaders or influencers, if you will. So as early as 1962, there was a placeholder for an organization called the Agricultural Education Foundation. That later morphed into the California Agricultural Leadership Foundation, and we are an organization that we would like to always make clear is that we're supported entirely by contributions from the public sector and individuals that have either participated in the program or industry supporting the program. The model for California's program originally came out of Michigan. Because of Michigan and the Kellogg Foundation originally, there was an opportunity to begin agricultural leadership training in a formal manner. The fact is that the Michigan program, even though it started before ours in 1970 when we, we started, we are the longest continuously operating program because they had a couple of hiatuses during their tenure. But we were started due to the foresight of three groups in particular. First, the Irvine Foundation, the J.G. Boswell Foundation, and then the Kellogg Foundation put up the money to start the program. So what was the reason again for ag leadership starting? As we were looking at the world, we could see that the population was changing, globalization was beginning to take place. There was a isolation recognized in the rural sector and the need to better educate farmers, if you will. Keep in mind that in prior to 1970, probably less than 20% of production agriculturalists had a college education. Now that number is more than 80%. But at the time, there was need for more formal education. And one of the big reasons that there clearly was a need was, and this is amazing to me because I don't think a lot of people remember this, but prior to 1967 and 68, in the state of California, the California State Senate was based more on the federal model where representation was based on counties, not population. And the rules in those days were that you could have no less than one county in represented and no more than three. So the California State Senate was really based upon those county lines, which meant what? Rural counties had a great amount of influence. Agriculture, therefore, had a great amount of influence. If you think back, L.A. County had one senator, one senator, 
Could you imagine that now? San Francisco County had one senator at the, that point. So they knew we better do a better job in terms of communicating, particularly with decision makers. What is unique about the Ag Leadership Program is that in California, we signed a memorandum of understanding 50 years ago with four universities. Most other states, and there are something like 38 that have agricultural leadership programs, those states are really based upon being an advocate and specifically identifying issues and saying, we're going to train you about these issues and you're, therefore you're going to go forward and talk more appropriately on those issues. Ours was a different philosophy. Ours was, we are not an advocacy organization, but do we produce better advocates? We better. And we decided the best way to do that was in partnership with, at the time, the four universities that had the major colleges of agriculture. So you had UC Davis, you had Fresno State, you had Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly Pomona. Since that time, of course, Chico State has also grown its College of Agriculture, and we work with them on a consistent but more informal basis. It is incredible to think, and these people at the universities will tell you, that after almost 50 years, they're still getting along and talking to each other. That's remarkable. And they really look at this as an opportunity, particularly through the deans of the colleges of agriculture, as well as the presidents, for an opportunity to come together for the benefit of this Ag Leadership Program. So, again, the need at the time was identified as a quasi-liberal arts education combined with a journey of personal growth and the development of leadership capabilities. When the program started, to give you an idea, in 1970, first of all, guess what? No one, what a shock, right? And all of a sudden they said, we're not going to admit women until class seven. But they started out with 30 individuals, and 24 of those 30 individuals had to be dirt farmers. They had to be the guy out on the tractor. They had to be the person involved with production agriculture. How has that changed? Tremendously. But it was really about taking people from this rural environment and exposing them, and many times making them feel uncomfortable by what is now a 17-month course with 12 seminars at the four universities, and we also had a national trip and an international trip where they are really uh, taken and exposed. It was much more simple in those days trying to get people simply to be in different and many times uncomfortable environments. We currently say, what is our mission? We say, we grow leaders who make a difference. We don't define what that difference is. We don't say that it has to be in public policy. It can be with their community, it can be with their school board, it can be with their church, it can be certainly uh, in helping their own relationships with their business and their families. Because our vision is simply to be a catalyst for a vibrant agricultural community. We now have about 1,250 alumni that go back to that class one in 1970. Our goal as a foundation is to keep this program vibrant, and about 10 years ago, we restructured the curriculum to focus more on individual leadership development and coaching. So part of our curriculum now includes a coaching component where our faculty, we have core faculty at each of the four universities, takes part in that coaching as well as personality assessment and evaluation. So we go through all of these things, understanding that you don't need to be an extrovert or an introvert to be an effective leader. You have to understand your own strengths and weaknesses, and that's what's important. So this program, I think, has developed over the years and evolved in such a way that it continues to be very valuable given the challenges. So that's some of the uh, background. And let me just tell you a little bit of personally. I was in class 13. So you do the math. We are now in the process of, of uh, soliciting class 50. 50. So I'm, I'm over 36 years ago. And I look back on my career, and it was one of the most impactful things that I ever experienced. And I continue to believe we have 
unlimited potential in helping develop people that are more in line with an evolving California. Because I'm sure as Congressman Farr will tell you, I've never met a farmer that didn't know he or she was right. They, they always know it. And, it, and, and they get it and they say, you know, it's, it's not my problem. It's if those other people just understand, we'll, we'll be fine. No, no, that's not going to get it. We have to understand that we're less than 2% of the population, and yet we play such a valuable role in the state and nation and internationally. I think it is our obligation and responsibility to better uh, help the process of being an influencer. And that's really what it's about. So 36 years ago, I uh, also uh, want to mention a name as well, that Congressman Farr. One of my classmates was a young man by the name of Cal Dooley. And Cal Dooley uh, turned out to be a seven-term congressman that worked with uh, Congressman Farr. And I, I consider him a prime example of a leader uh, who knows how to make a difference. So let's talk about California agriculture now. We have this wonderful program, but where, where are we really? Well, if you look at all of the wonderful statistics that come out, the first thing that will strike you is that based upon 2017 numbers, this is farm gate value. This is just, this isn't the processing and all of the billions that come with that. This is the value of the products as it comes off the dairy or out of the field. Over $50 billion worth. That was an increase of 6% from the year before. It was not the all-time record. A few years ago, we had about $54 billion. This represents 13.4% of the U.S. total. So when you think about that, in the United States, farm products, $374 billion. We have over 13% of that in California. Right there, that tells you where we start out. Then we talk about, well, how does California interact with the world market? In 2017, $20.5 billion were exported. So do the math real simple. You got $50 billion worth of product, 20 billion going out, that's 40%. 40% right there that's going out. So how important are exports to California? How important are exports to the world? Very much so. Now, this is a number that I think is a little misleading, and, and I, I get it. They report there are 77,000 farms and ranches in the state. 27% generated sales greater than 100,000. The national average is just under 20%. The definition of a farm, right? This is where we can probably debate a little bit. Do I really think that there are 77,000 viable farms out there? Probably not. No, no. But... It really tells you that uh, there's a lot of agriculture going on, and there's a lot of people that identify themselves, certainly, with farming. The amount of land devoted to farming and ranching was 25.3 million acres. Now, again, maybe a little bit misleading because this includes what? Range land as well. This is non-irrigated agriculture. So when you look at really the core of that $50 billion, you're really talking about 10 to 11 million acres of irrigated agriculture in the state. So keep in mind that number because we're going to be talking about something called Sigma and what, what the impact of that is. The average farm size was 328 acres in California. The national average is 444. We continue to uh, obviously uh, face a situation where many people do not understand the complexity of California agriculture. It's been reported that there are over 400 commercial crops out there. Uh, when you go to Iowa, you're not going to find 400. What are you going to find? You get corn, soybeans, wheat. You're going to, those are the program crops. And as we talk about things in the farm bill, those, those are what we're talking about. Now, the top five states in production. There's California at its 50 billion. Iowa next at just under 27 billion. Almost half. Almost half. Texas at almost 23 billion. Nebraska 21. Kind of surprised me to see Minnesota sneak in there at 17 billion. Yeah. But that gives you a perspective of how far 
we are out in front in terms of overall production as compared to the rest of the United States. So then we talk about, okay, where does all of this $50 billion come from? It's amazing to, to look at. Kern County uh, at over $7 billion is number one, but right there is also Tulare and Fresno County at over $7 billion as well. So there you have over 21 billion out of the 50 in three counties, in three counties. They're what? Dependent very much on irrigation and uh, groundwater as well as surface water too. Monterey, close to home here. I think you look at that production for Monterey at $4.4 billion, that's astounding. That really is. And one of the things I learned in coming over here, I, I moved here uh, full-time in 2016, and after working mostly in the Central Valley of California, the one thing that struck me most was the intensity of agriculture in the Salinas Valley and in Monterey County. This ground is so valuable, and when someone told me that our landlord, as a matter of fact, where we have our office out on Blanco Road, which is in between Marina and Salinas. And by the way, you're all invited. If you're ever going down to Blanco and you see this old 1880s farmhouse out there and it has an Ag Leadership Foundation, please stop by. We do not get enough visitors. We just don't. So please come by. But I was looking out that window at the ground around the office and I saw that they come in, they plant it, it grows very quickly. You can almost see it happening. They harvest it, it's plowed under, it's planted again, because guess what? At about $4,000 plus per acre for a lease amount, you better make the most of that, that ground. And so whether it's normal double cropping or sometimes even triple cropping. The other thing that struck me about uh, the, the situation of farming here is really the visibility of labor. In the Central Valley, we obviously have the need for a lot of labor, whether it has to do with table grapes or tree fruit or whatever. But those workers, for the most part, are hidden. They're in the vineyard. They're in the orchards and so forth. And what also jumped out at me was the fact that as I drive to work and I'm going down Blanco, I look over and when I see a crew of 200 individuals picking strawberries, I can see them and I can see how hard they're working. And I can see how difficult that is, or if they're chasing a mechanized machine that's going through and harvesting broccoli or cauliflower or lettuce, you can really see that these are tough jobs. These are tough jobs, and they're very much needed, but it is, again, that perception and visibility. You go down the list, Stanislaus, Merced, San Joaquin, you have to go to Ventura before you jump out of the San Joaquin Valley and then Kings County. When you add in Madera County, the area from basically San Joaquin County to Kern County produces 70% of our gross farm gate value. That's incredible. And that's going to change. And we're going to talk about that because of the, the water situation. So here are the commodities. When you say, okay, you got all that money in California, where does it show up? Milk and cream. Milk and cream, the number one dairy state in the United States is not Wisconsin. It's, it's California. Over 6.5 billion. Grapes, and grapes is a combination of wine grapes, table grapes, and raisin grapes as well. So uh, those, they're all three there. Almonds. We've all heard about almonds, particularly over the last decade. A couple of decades ago, you know, almonds, almonds weren't a big deal. I remember growers struggling uh, when they got 60 cents a pound for almonds. And yet, through world demand, because somewhere between 70 to 80 percent of California almonds are exported, because of world demand, we now have over a million acres of almonds in this state. Why do, you, why do they plant it? Because you can make money on it, and because there's a demand for them. So they are now number three, berries, including all strawberries. Um, I, I look at uh, locally all of these wonderful family-owned companies, uh, starting with Driscoll's and others. 
what a great job they do in terms of growing demand for berries. Because this doesn't happen by accident. It's about smart promotion. And they do a wonderful job. And if you go to many supermarkets, the number one category in the produce department is berries. If they make their money. Cattle and calves, uh, 2.6 million. There's the lettuce. Lettuce, all kinds, and so forth. 2.4 billion. Walnuts, 1.5. Tomatoes, which includes canned and processed tomato as well as, as fresh tomatoes. And then the, the other one that uh, is going to be moving up, I think rather rapidly, is pistachios. Pistachios is a, is a crop uh, that is growing in international demand as well. Uh, China, obviously, is a very big customer for pistachios, and we see growing acreage. And the problem with pistachios is it takes an extended period of time to get them into production. A few years ago, it was thought that it took at least seven to eight years to get a commercial crop of pistachios. That's now been accelerated somewhat, but you can imagine uh, the financial risk for people going in to plant something and saying, I'm hoping that seven and eight years down the road, the market still holds up. Bankers get real nervous about those kinds of things. So, but pistachios, uh, I, I had one acquaintance uh, who was 94 years old, and he decided to plant pistachios. And I said, there's not. You're 94 years old, they're going to be around when those come in production, and they're going to make money. So that, that's great. So ag exports. Now, when you really look at this, out of that $20.56 billion, it was relatively flat in 2017, only up 2.2%. But if you go back to 2007, you can see how the growth has really been dynamic. It's up almost 84%. If we can produce those products, there will be a demand. It grew 32.5% there. The largest growth for a single commodity was that uh, one I mentioned, pistachios, grew by almost a third as well. So one of the questions we always get about is, okay, what about uh, the trade war with China? What, what is that going to do here? Well, first you have to look at and say, what is most vulnerable? When we look at the Chinese market, you can see that the primary commodities that are involved here are pistachios, almonds, wine, oranges, and cotton. Relatively non-perishable, by the way, when you look at that and say, okay, uh, with the exception of oranges, but they they can hold up pretty well. You get down to table grapes, and that's really your Paris commodity. And I would say that pistachios and almonds basically figured out ways to continue shipping to China through non-traditional channels by trans-shipping, going to other countries and working on that. There was some impact, but thus far it's been relatively minor. The biggest impact certainly was on the fresh product like table grapes. You look at table grape returns this last year, they were probably the worst in 20 years. And a lot of that had to do with the uncertainty of the international market. So moving ahead, walnuts, concern, and obviously beef. Where is the impact most felt? Well, you're not going to feel the impact as much here in Monterey County or on the Central Coast based upon the commodity mix of those commodities we just talked about. But again, the, the big ones are the three, Kern, Tulare, and Fresno County. They all were probably more impacted in terms of reduced revenue than any other counties in the state. Uh, this is a, uh, a confusing situation in many ways because I talk to growers all the time. Uh, they are inherently, it seems, conservative in most of their beliefs. They want to, to do the right thing. Uh, they want to be supportive. And yet, when we have situations like this, they are truly suffering in many of these ways. And I continue to wonder, uh, at what point do you get to the, the fact that their priorities aren't aligned with their leadership. And I think we're, we're not there yet, but I think the level of frustration as we work through these things uh, continues 
to rise. Let me talk a little bit about uh, also a perspective from the point of view of the National Defense University, NDU, of course, which was created uh, as a means of the various branches of the military to get together to educate, and I love this term, war fighters. War fighters in critical thinking and the creative application of military power to inform national strategy. So as part of our program and that those 12 seminars that we talk about for the Ag Leadership people, when we go back to the East Coast, and we usually do something like we did this year, where we'll, we'll go to Philadelphia, and we went to Philadelphia to study uh, incarceration proceedings, and uh, we worked in trying to expose people to those issues. Then we would go to Gettysburg, and we would talk about uh, all of the different leadership lessons that come out of the Battle of Gettysburg. And then we go to D.C. and one of the places, in addition to meeting with policymakers and so forth, is going to the National Defense University because of their interest in learning more about the strategic importance of agriculture, and particularly California agriculture. So when we go back to NDU, we're met with some wonderful individuals and a cross-section of the world. These aren't just individuals from the U.S. military. They are from allies from all over the world. And we're able to sit down with them and talk about issues that are related to things like food security. Because one of the things we all understand, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but we under, know that the global population will increase by over 30% by 2050. The real issue is the United States' role in supplying food security outside of its borders. The United States contributes the, to the domestic economy by providing food, fiber, medicine, and biofuel to address global demand. The U.S. enjoys food sovereignty and export food products as well as feed for livestock. That's a key statement. We're able to do this. Not many nations can. The U.S. also continues to shape the industry by leveraging the strength of innovation. These are key points that we all look towards. If we cannot continue to innovate, the status quo will not hold. And California, without innovation, will not be the agricultural giant it is today. And it's, and it's very reassuring to understand that we have leaders at the national level that understand that. When you look at the challenges, and as I specifically uh, look at these times, I want to make sure that uh, we're doing okay on time. Okay. okay, so we look at labor, and these are statistics that they've used, and I think they're, they're fairly accurate. An average of 1.1 million hired farm workers employed in the U.S. Think in terms of California, out of that 1.1, maybe 450,000 workers. So again, a disproportionate amount because of the need for hand labor that we have. Over 61% of those hired in the fruit and vegetable sector are not legally authorized. Now we've said that in terms of agriculture, and we know how frustrating it is to try to get comprehensive immigration reform. It is vital to get comprehensive immigration reform. In its absence, we are left with innovation or a change of the status quo. Immigrant labor makes the agriculture industry particularly vulnerable to uncertainties. This is a concern at the national level. This is a national security concern. If all of a sudden we lose our ability to be this giant, in production of fruits and vegetables and products that we can use throughout the world, that impacts our ability to lead and what our influence is in the world. I was pleased to see that they talked specifically about the H-2A Temporary Ag Worker Program, the H-2A program, which they say does not provide the efficiency nor the flexibility to mitigate U.S. labor shortfalls. One of the things you see here locally is that local companies are having to turn to H-2A in the face of labor shortages. They have no other choice. Now what's happening is the system is being strained. 
10 years ago, very, maybe one or two producers in California was using H2A label, labor. Now, there are dozens of major companies, and they, it is expensive, it is hard because of the bureaucratic process involved, and many times, the ability to get labor on a timely basis in order to harvest these perishable crops simply doesn't exist. And moving ahead, whatever persuasion you are, I think it's clear from the point of view of food production, we need a workable program that allows people to come in, better their lives, as well as help us provide the food that is so vital to the world. Water. This is always one of the things we hear in California, right, as well. When, when we were talking about certain water bonds and things, we always hear, well, you know, agriculture uses 80% of the water. 80% of the water. Now, worldwide, they, they quote a number that agriculture uses 70%. Uh, this is a, a particularly a spot that many farmers just kind of bristle over, right? They go, I'm using the water? Who, who's eating the product of, of this that I'm, I'm growing? You know, can we, can we restart this discussion somehow? But the bottom line is, utilization rates are significantly outpacing steady state water availability. And that's in the world. That's in the world. And that is a concern that we have this growing population. How are we going to have this natural resource necessary for that production? The impacts of depleted aquifers will be catastrophic and a potential catalyst for expanded conflict. We don't think in those terms, right? We think in terms of, wow, you know, uh, the farmer's going to have to take this out of production. But if you're in between India and Pakistan, and all of a sudden there becomes an issue over water, you're talking about the reality of real conflict. So how important is water? It's very, very important. And when you look at California, we're going to talk specifically about some of the things that are being done to address that. Climate change. There's still a lot of folks out there that, that uh, you know, really don't want to uh, move on with it or discuss it or whatever, but the National Defense University uh, talks about there is generally universal acceptance that climate change is indeed occurring. Now, God bless our government officials. I love this next statement. The impact of increasing temperatures and weather extremes on agriculture cannot be understated. I, I think they meant overstated, but, you know, I, I, I think we get, we get what they were trying to say. And, and uh, you know, this was probably somebody from Iceland that, that did this report. I, it, I, I get what they're saying, because warmer regions will eventually yield fewer crops as a result of heat stress, severe weather, and expect an increase in crop pests and disease. Uh, I guess what we haven't answered is, will there be a benefit to certain areas of warming? That's, that's a game I don't think we want to try to gamble on, necessarily, with, with the hope that somehow, all of a sudden, Oregon becomes the next Napa Valley. You no, know, I'd rather keep Napa Valley in, in Napa Valley and uh, do it from that point of view. So, as we talk about these issues from our perspective, the need for a stable workforce and comprehensive immigration reform in the face of unprecedented political division and partisanship. Uh, you know, I, I have been going back to Washington, D.C. for a long time, and it's, it's discouraging. It is discouraging to see where, where we are in these kinds of discussions and the importance and the frustrations, and where, where will the leadership come from? Uh, it, it is clearly there that we need a, a, a reasonable policy, because what's working right now is, is not only broken, it's, it's making things worse, you know, from every perspective, from every perspective we have. So this is, our hope is that we are able to develop those individuals and influencers that begin to really make a difference in the conversation. Quite frankly, I, I came to the realization that unless we have leaders that are more people of color, more women, and this comes from somebody 
who was a very proud Republican for 47 years, until two years ago I said, you know what, this is not the answer. This is not the answer. Does that mean I'm a Democrat? Oh, hell no. <laughs> but, you know, but I'm just saying that what we have to do is start working on solutions and really working in a way that will benefit everyone. This immigration is a situation which is so perplexing in that it should be a win-win. We have individuals from a very poor region or countries that want to better their lives. We have opportunity for them. We have need for them. You would think based upon that need and opportunity, we could come together with a workable program. And yet, we let uh, the dialogue drift into very non-productive areas. So, we need to uh, develop those inflows. The need for an adequate and dependable water supply in a time of growing environmental activism as well as a growing disconnect with consumers where their food comes from. This, this is what's concerning many times. I think there are very well-meaning groups out there that uh, have, have really lacked the understanding of the importance of farming and the infrastructure. We have people tell us, well, you don't need almonds. We don't need almonds to live. We don't need to export these almonds. Well, I tell you what, if we lose that infrastructure that produces those almonds, we're not going to be able to snap our fingers and grow and have food security and food safety and those issues that are out there. So what we need to understand is we have to balance. Balance is the key. We know we're overdrafting the aquifers, as evidenced by the fact that the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was passed a few years ago. Nobody disagreed with the notion that we're overdrafting our underground resources. What we are now going to see, and I think most people agree with this, is that out of that 10 to 11 million acres of irrigated lands, mostly in the Central Valley, but also certainly some impact in the Salinas Valley, there are estimates that 500,000 to a million acres will come out of production come out of production because they simply will not be the water supplies. And you already see now with the creation of this law and the agencies that are going to be required to oversee and administer it, what this game is going to look like because all of a sudden people will now say, do I have to buy 600 acres in order to farm 400? What do I have to do to stay at least economically viable. So Sigma, I think we're getting to some critical points where now we're starting to identify the specific changes and thus there will be winners and there will be losers. And usually where there are losers, they run to get what? Lawyers. And then the lawyers start in all of this and we're gonna have a very contentious process, I think, moving forward, but clearly, we are going to see a shrinkage of the acreage base in California. Somebody you know, makes a comment and says, well, you know, we, we have over a million acres of alfalfa. Do we really need alfalfa? Well, you ask the dairy guys. Ask the dairy guys if they need alfalfa. If we did. And it's a very thirsty crop. There is no question about that. So who will be making these decisions? Will it be economics? Will it be... Others that, that really uh, try to decide, this, this is a huge, huge game changer in terms of California. The other thing is the impact of the competitiveness for, from California agriculture regulations while acknowledging the need for reasonable and efficient oversight. Nobody says we shouldn't have regulation. We have to have regulation. I think that's important. We have to keep in mind that at times we don't want our public policy leaders getting so far out in front that it renders us non-competitive and therefore non-existent. We, and when we look at things, and the citrus industry did a great study, they showed that the regulatory costs in California were something like one-tenth of what it was in Texas. Does that mean Texas is right? Of course not. No. <clears throat> Texas probably needs to do some things. But if all of a sudden we get so far out of whack, and we lose markets and ability to produce, 
Those are the unintended consequences that will impact the consumer as well. And finally, as we talk about California farmers, one of the things I have constantly heard in all of my discussions, whether it's in Sacramento or Washington, D.C., we would go back and say, here are our issues, we need to change this, or this, we're going to have these consequences. And what happens mostly? We're around. We stay around. We're resilient. Farmers tend to figure a, a way out, and they make changes. And that's wonderful. But that resiliency has also created the impression with many decision makers that they, these folks are crying wolf a lot. They come here and they talk about dire consequences, and they are back the next year. At what point do we get to a tipping point where we, we can't come back? I'm not sure, and that's a very complicated question. But I do know that all of these challenges, and particularly here in the Salinas Valley, the changes we're going to see are going to come through innovation, through technology, through mechanization, like we can't even imagine right now. I think uh, we're being pushed into it maybe quicker than a lot of people think. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel right. But I think it's there, and I think it's happening. I think if you ever get the opportunity, you should go by the Western Growers Center for Innovation over in Salinas in the Taylor Building and see some of the startups and some of the individuals and some of the ideas that are going through. Uh, you know, I've had people say, well, we'll ne never be able to mechanically uh, harvest table grapes, for instance. It's, you, you have to have that, that human touch. No, I, I think table grapes within the next two decades will be mechanically harvested, de-stemmed, and bagged in the field with very little human milk on that. So, as we look at, at California agriculture, tremendously important, tremendously strong in many ways, but with tremendous challenges. Part of what we want to do is create the next generation of leaders who understand it's not a simple situation anymore. That in working with consumers and policymakers, that we all have to meet somewhere in the middle. The answers will not be found at the extremes. So with that, I am going to thank you very much for your time and effort, and we'll answer any questions. Thank you. The question is about the impact of, of large corporate farming. Uh, let, me, let me relate to you a story of how things evolved and, and people's perceptions. Uh, Forty plus years ago, California, being the number one producer of table grapes at that time, produced 20 million boxes of table grapes with 1,200 growers. 1,200 growers. We now produce 120 million boxes of table grapes with 400 growers. So a six time increase in production with a third of the growers. This is really the direction in many ways of agriculture and consolidation. And it's not limited just to production agriculture, it's limited to the entire supply chain. Whether it's the retailer, the wholesaler, or production agriculture, we continue to see consolidation because of the economic pressures that are involved. I think most people would say that uh, the impact of corporate agriculture uh, is, is uh, not negative, but the perception is negative without understanding that if you look at, at many of the so-called big ag companies, they're still in family ownership. They are vertically integrated operations, whether it's the Ryder family, whether it's the Taylor family locally here, these are not small businesses. They are very large, sophisticated businesses. Now, if you're talking about ConAgra, that's a different scope and, and scale. But when you look at California agriculture, corporate agriculture, I think, is uh, 
is, is misunderstood and compared many times to what, what people see as Midwestern corporate agriculture. Uh, we certainly have it here. Uh, I think most people will tell you that it's a, it's a legal format more than a reality, than a mindset. Question here. Um, with uh, so many uh, undocumented workers in, in the business, and it seems like they're very much needed and the farmers want them, how do we keep good border security and maybe have like the Bracero program back? I understand it worked very well, and then it got snarled into some politics, and it disappeared, something that didn't need to be fixed. Do we, we have a comment over here from this gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, get in the microphone. That's a dangerous to Congress. <laughs> I rarely do this voluntarily. Well, I just want to thank you for coming. Uh, anybody who loves the Monterey Peninsula has got to love and appreciate and support agriculture in Salinas Valley. It is the buffer that keeps the reports from living here. And in that, in that valley, I mean, for, I'm an environmentalist, and what I've learned about agriculture, it's the, it's the open space of California. It's why we love this. And the only way we're going to sustain it is keeping uh, agriculture economically viable. You can't just zone it. And we have, in Monterey County, I mean, with the figures, your fourth largest uh, producer of income in the United States, it's number one in the number of products, crops that it grows. We grow over 100 crops in Monterey County. There are only three places in the world that have this microplane. So we think that this, this county is sort of known for its coastline of Pebble Beach. It's really known to people who grow things as one of the unique places in the world that you can grow almost anything. And the workforce, which is your question, is about this labor force. It's just politics. It's people that don't want to essentially if, if you had, if you brought a bill, a comprehensive immigration bill to the floor, it would pass easily. But the Republican Party has decided among its membership not to allow those bills to go to the floor. Why? Because many of the really right-wing conservatives feel that people who have come across this border without papers, who are illegal, should have to pay a penalty. When you commit a crime, you've got to go to jail. And their idea of going to jail is get them all back, send them home. If you do that, we lose this agriculture. And the reason we need to keep agriculture viable is that cities like uh, Soledad right now have zoned, have uh, uh, annexed their city. If you allowed Soledad to build out, they'd be bigger than Salinas. And if they're bigger than Salinas, it's 200,000 people there. And those people are, you know, eventually we're just going to squeeze us out of here. So our agriculture is not supported by the federal government. It's done, it's free market enterprise. It exports to dozens of countries around the world. We're often riddled, not just export to that country. We have our products, mostly salads and, and all the salad bowl uh, issues. And I, I fell in love with agriculture, uh, being in politics for almost 40 years, realizing that the open space in California is not protected by government. It's not all in national parks, state parks, and, Reserves. It's in agriculture. And as long as we can keep that agriculture environment, I mean, economically viable through the issues that you raise, we can sustain the state in a beautiful way. Our water in this Monterey County doesn't get water from anywhere else. It's our water that falls from the sky. We collect it in two dams in southern Monterey County, and we ship it down the Salinas River. It recharges the aquifer, and we can get smarter about that plumbing so that we can sustain agriculture without it using. Uh, without abusing the water. So I, I appreciate it. it's interesting that you come and speak to a World Affairs Council. But these are the people that are the doers, the thinkers, and the shakers who vote and participate. And I think it's really important for them to understand that our biggest job market here in Montana County is agriculture. And it's worldwide. And you get masters and PhDs and work in agriculture because it's not just picking crops, it's marketing those crops, it's picking, uh, buying the equipment. It's doing what Taylor Farms is doing, which is a billion dollar industry. Head of an that's a billion dollar industry, all in Monterey County. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and, and give you my thoughts on, on border security. Uh, everyone agrees on border security, and the way you address that is exactly what you said, is to have a workable program to allow people to temporarily come into the United States, do the job, get what they want in terms of a better life for them and their families, and then return. And, and I think that, uh, that that will hopefully be a reasonable alternative at some point. We're not even having that kind of reasonable discussion, unfortunately, at, at this, this juncture. We need to. We need to say, look, uh, uh, many people look at the Brocero program due to its abuses. And, and there were some abuses there. No, no question about it. But let's not let that taint our ability to move forward. And I, I truly believe that the solution has to be, I don't like the term guest worker because they're not guests. You know, this, this is, these are laborers that come over here, they're helping us. We want to give them something that's valuable as well and fair. So uh, I, I believe that many Republicans tend to look at trying to make H2A that program. I don't think that's possible to make it that flexible. I think there needs to be increased flexibility to H2A, but I don't think that you can make it into the guest worker program that eventually will, will be work, will workable. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned uh, being, thank you very much for a very, uh, for me, very informative uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned being able to see the student working people in the fields. And another thing that I'm always aware of is the overhead sprinklers blowing away in the middle of the day, all the water just blowing away. What's being done to innovate and support drip irrigation? The, the, uh, the reality is that there has been tremendous advances in irrigation technology. There are centers for that. And now you're seeing much more even underground drip that you may not even notice in a lot of these, these vegetable fields. Uh, flood irrigation, which used to be very prevalent over in the valley where you would just run the water down the road, road is, is still there, but it, it's very, very small. With Sigma, you're, you're going to see uh, some changes. But one of the things we need to understand, consequences of any of these changes, when they moved away from above ground irrigation techniques such as flood and all of this, we weren't recharging the aquifers like we were before. We were keeping that water just around the root zone, and that, that was fine. But what were we doing? We were still further depleting the water supply, and we're not recharging. So there has to be an understanding, and they're starting to get it, uh, particularly in the Central Valley. In wet winters, we ought to be flooding certain crops during the winter. Not that they need water whatever, but you can flood certain crops without detrimental impact and start working proactively on recharging that groundwater supply. So um, who are some of the uh, leaders in automating um, agriculture, um, some of the organizations, companies? Yeah, I, I mean, when I think about uh, locally here, you, you think about, you mentioned uh, Tanamura and Anil and the way they develop plant tea. And that, uh, you know, it used to be a thing where the workers would go in and put each individual plant in or whatever. Now it's mechanized on a tape that goes through and, and just drops the tape down. And so it's a tremendous saving. You look at people like Driscoll's and what they're doing on potentially mechanizing harvesting. Now that's, that's hard, right? You think about uh, a strawberry plant and you've got to select those out. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed that people are still talking about driving cars without any, you know, running at the wheel kind of thing. So, do I worry about them picking strawberries? That way? No, I think it'll, it'll happen. But you really, and what the change is that uh, 40 years ago, most innovation came through government oversight and services. You saw more coming out of your land grant universities doing research, and that is still very, very important. But the change has been more of these individual companies investing research dollars. Almost every large company has their own research department. Well, Barry, oh, we do have another question. You want to do that or shall I? I'll do it. Uh, 
Uh, just how depleted are our aquifers in uh, underground water in California? How bad is it? Overall, it, it, it is a serious concern, uh, particularly when you talk about overdrawn aquifers, you're going to think mostly about the area, uh, I would say, and I'm, I'm not the expert here, but I would say from, say, Madera County through Kern County. I think that that is really the ground zero for overdrafting. When you look at uh, many of the ground subsidence issues, on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. It, it is amazing. You know, you go up and you see telephone poles sitting six feet up from where the ground used to be. So uh, that that is going to be uh, an issue. The, the ironic thing is, the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, an alluvial floodplain, has some of the richest and most productive soils in the world, notwithstanding the fact that it has natural elements which causes issues like selenium, arsenic, and, and some other things. These, these are the challenges of understanding that we're not going to be farming all of that. Uh, so it, it's, when you look at Northern California, uh, Sacramento North, relatively of mind mind kind of situation. Uh, I think the, the real ground zero is that Southern San Joaquin Valley. Well, Barry, thank you very much for a wonderful overview.